Welcome to the online launch session, Kubernetes and Database as a Service Interaction in a Secure Cloud Environment. I'm very happy that we are able to attract such a large number of participants for the session. We have prepared some exciting topics for you. After the intro and overview by COO and co-founder Antoine Coissier, we get into the topic Kubernetes and database interaction in a secure cloud environment with Hans Berndl and security options provided by our cloud solution. After this session, Dennis Arns will show us a demo about how modern platform features like container orchestration, managed data services, and automation can boost your data center productivity. At the end of the webinar, we will answer all raised questions in the Q&A session with our experts. I would like to hand over to COO and co-founder Antoine Kautzier, who oversees the businesses and operational aspects of the Exoscale platform with his 20 years of experience in the service provider business. I hope you enjoy the online session. The stage is yours, Antoine. Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for, for this last uh, webinar of the um, Exoscale webinar of 2021. Uh, with an exciting series, I'm extremely happy that we were able to do the uh, keep the rhythm of doing one of those webinars uh, per quarter, uh, and we intend to to pursue that in the in next year, um, giving you know, the, the positive feedback we we have um, we have received. I'd like to um, start with uh, introducing the topics of today a bit a bit deeper, and I mean this big statement. Security matters, of course. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's everywhere. Uh, and very recently, this uh, Java vulnerability affecting all companies worldwide, almost. Um, it, it it it's everywhere. But the the place where, and if we can go to the next slide, it matters even more. Is that security? Yes, there's vulnerability in softwares. Uh, in, in platforms sometimes, but the user security, the, the, the behavior awareness matters even more. I mean, this is where we see the flows uh, coming from. Uh, just one figure uh, to share with you. Um, if you can move to the next one today. And Hans will go much more detail in, the, in his presentation. Less than 10% of our users out of dozens of thousands of users on the platform exoscale platforms have two-factor authentication activity and so that's a staggering number it's, it's not enough um, uh, and, and we we can do uh, we can do better so um, stay on with us to, to learn about um, i mean how the base security layer of just accessing a cloud platform can be uh, uh, can be activated and uh, also with the, the new feature that we are, we are re releasing. Um, what's next with Exoscale? Um, it's um, um, sort of taking this a bit of uh, showing uh, the, the, what's uh, coming on the, on the roadmap. Platform-wise, SSO, which we are launching today, and there will be a, a visual dem demonstration of that uh, from, uh, from Hans. Uh, right next. Uh, also on the platform side, uh, with in our academy, we are going to introduce the. We already have the SKS introduction, uh, Kubernetes introduction course. Uh, there will be now an exam topping the uh, topping the the, 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 the content. Uh, so if you want to get certified, uh, you can uh, you can already send your interest to academy at exoscale.com, and we'll uh, send you the invites once the the exam is uh, is launched. Uh, you can also expect in the very early stage of uh, 2022 a new GPU flavor uh, coming from uh, coming from Exoscale. Um, um, this will be available in uh, in uh, Frankfurt uh, as the Frankfurt zone was not covered by uh, GPU capacity yet. Database as a service uh, still uh, increasing the uh the, the features and the the width of the service so one new addition with open search will be launched very soon uh, before the end of the year and also 
there will be introduction of a new feature, which is the ability to have read replicas. Uh, so where you can have a one single or cluster running uh, that then uh, uh, is sending his, uh, uh, its information to another cluster running on the same zone or on another zone. Um, the two services don't have to be the, the same site. This is particularly relevant for PostgreSQL and uh, MySQL, of course. On the Kubernetes side, our SKS platform, we're following our lifecycle uh, rhythm and uh, expect a new version 1.23 to be uh, expect to be launched uh, also in the in the weeks to to come. It's a it's not a major version. This one uh, 1.25 will be a, will be a, a bigger one, so it should not break your uh, uh, configurations too much. Um, on that note. Um, We've been doing those webinars for the full year. We've also successfully run two on-site events despite uh, COVID and the, and the challenges of, of doing this. Uh, so we were in Antalaken and in, in Geneva um, more recently. Our plan is to continue this Ocho, <laughs> um, one per quarter. So we'll be starting the year uh, being present in Munich hopefully bringing a, an exciting day with our partners and, and customers with uh, user stories uh, around the uh, cloud computing, of course. Then Zurich um, and uh, in, in the first semester, and we will have Vienna uh, and Frankfurt following on uh, starting September 2022. So um, if we don't meet uh, in the webinars, then maybe we can also meet in person. Uh, Exoscale is a proximity cloud and we, we intend to, to keep on that promise. Um, on that note, I would like to introduce Hans for the security brief part. Thank you Antoine. Switching over to my presentation. Yeah, security, that's my topic today. I got 20 minutes, so I want to make them count because it's a super important topic. Let's dig into it. Um, we heard already about the, the Java uh, vulnerability. I did a quick, I wouldn't call it research, but look around on the internet, what's going on in, in, the, in the security realm. Uh, security risks, uh, everywhere discussed, pointed out. Um, I try to look at Gartner because I know many enterprise customers are looking to Gartner for advice or what's going on. Um, and yes, there's, there's more going on in the cloud, which, which we recognize and which we appreciate. Uh, some point out that's also some potential risk. So if we put more in the cloud, that could be a potential risk. Yeah, that's obvious. Um, but I think that's more going on than congregating some information in a certain place. On the other hand side, cloud providers are experts, are specialists, and probably taking care in a more sophisticated, in a deeper way than some customer can do it on their own because security has become a really business on its own. We have one security department in, in our organization really looking deep into that. So it's, it's not easy to handle all the time. So we need experts, and we are really focused on having that expert. Uh, if you if you look across <laughs> across the big pond uh, in America, they they have a big cybersecurity threat, and it, it's it's a presidential matter more or less. If you follow the the, the media, so executive order on improving national cybersecurity, uh, all the big players in in computer technology were invited to help with that situation. The other thing I've discovered is that, yeah, there's also some education going on. So there are courses uh, dealing with addressing issues in the cloud and how you can better configure, better prevent uh, security stuff happening to you. Uh, I found that course, which uh, curiously is one of my former colleagues from a from, uh, former employer who is doing that course is now with, with Gartner and, and looking into what you can do in securing public cloud services, what mitigating factors in, in considering 
infrastructure as a service uh, product and, and what are the challenges if you use software as a service. So the, the main topics everybody has to deal with when it's considering and more using the cloud. Um, coming back a little bit more to Gartner, Gartner has always these trends. And if you look what, what was the trend for 2021, certainly cybersecurity, as we have seen uh, before. Um, and there's certainly a technical approach to that, that you, you, you position your countermeasures and your monitoring in a different way, uh, because the way we work has changed, not, not only through COVID, so there's no, re no remote working explicitly more. It's, it's kind of working because remote working become the normal working. The other thing which is very important in security is uh, the human factor. So it's not a finger pointing at, at, at managers or the board members, but sometimes their accounts are used to, to send out emails to employees to trick them into do something they shouldn't do uh, because the security measures for those accounts wasn't high enough or wasn't secured enough. So cyber safety for board members is, is a topic, vendor consolidation, yeah, it's a, to find the, the golden middle ground because having a one vendor strategy isn't really always um, the best solution. Having a lot of vendors opens up many different attack surfaces, which is another problem. So finding the really the right way there is, is something you have to evaluate for yourself. Uh, identity topics, managing a, a lot more machines and, and the security um, configuration of those machines. We're using way more devices to access certain information within our enterprise IT environments. I mentioned already the remote working, um, something that have to be taken into account, like we do fire drills uh, or, or used to do fire drills in the office that we know what's, what's to be done. The same has to be done also for security measures. And that, that's one thing we also, for our, our security department offers is, uh, penetration testing of, of systems, for example, to really check, am I secure? Are my locks high secure locks so that nobody can come in? So this, these are all topics you have to consider. So it, as I've mentioned before, it's really an area on its own. You really have to have experts to take care of all that. And, but it's, it's easy to start with, with little things to improve dramatically your, your security situation. Because whatever and however you run your IT services, so if you have still your own data center and it's your IT resources, or if you already moved into the cloud and you use cloud resources, it's still the same obligation that you have to take care of those resources and make, make them secure and run them secure wherever they are physically located and who owns them and who is responsible for the physical assets. But using them, you have to make sure that you use them in a secure way. And yeah, there still be, for me, there's another motion coming up because in, in, a couple of years ago, there was still this debate, yeah, sh should we use cloud anyway? I think we are almost past the discussion. So people are convinced cloud is the right way to go. There are many benefits. It's, it's not anymore this pure cost discussion, which sometimes is, is not really the, the way to go, uh, but it's, it's, way more often the discussion about time to market and being competitive and that can only be achieved to use a certain amount of cloud technologies today otherwise you are not competitive and what i see and what i found also in my, my little research is that the question is the cloud secure this question is coming up and it's, it's it's used to kind of not adopting the cloud so it's 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 a critical situation that people holding back on, on using something they would really could improve their their service level their interaction with customers yeah, the, the quality of the service by not being convinced that this is the the right way to go or it's a secure way to go that that's the that's the question so the 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 task for cios is basically to transform that question is the cloud secure in a in a question which is more like the line of, am I using the cloud securely? And if you compare that, if I may, if we, if we rephrase those two questions, is the car secure? Am I using the car securely? I'm driving the car securely. That's, that's two different things. The car per se 
uh, yeah, it's it's safely built and it's to the up to the high measures. But if I'm driving carelessly, then it's probably not secure uh, how I go about the streets. Uh, so it's also about using the technology. It's not the technology alone. It's about the usage as well. And I think that that change in mindset and and, and rephrasing the questions in the right direction is very important. A good start, as we have seen by the statistic of Antoine, we are below 10% is enabling two-factor authentication. That's that's an important thing to do, uh, not only for, for your account, uh, but for all your accounts that are using the Exascale uh, infrastructure, so enabling it for all accounts in your Exascale organization. And we support a, a variety of tools because two-factor authentication, I have my password, I have a, an additional uh, second factor, which usually is done with our nice smartphones, and with both together, I'm getting a, a secure look, and I can uh, secure my assets more easily. We support a variety of, of applications you can put on your smart device. Usually, it's the smartphone. That's the thing we all carry along with us everywhere, basically. So you put one of those applications on and then you're, you're good to go. I'm actually using two for, for different, I'm using Google Authenticator and Microsoft Authenticator, but whatever it's the best fit for your organization, we support as many as possible with, with our platform that makes it easier for you. What I try to do, and which is also done in the, the PDF you will get is how to find all that stuff on the platform, how to enable it. Uh, so if you go to your uh, account details, uh, and in passwords and security, you can enable two-factor authentication there. That's only for your account, but that's that's the way to start it. Uh, if you're the owner of the organization, that's, that's the first thing, which is very important to do. The next thing, if you, if you hit the green button, set up two-factor authentication, what happens then? You get that little pop-up, you put in your password, the password you, you use to log on to your, your platform, and then you get a picture like this. Usually you use then already your smartphone. There you put on one of the authenticator apps, uh, scan in the QR code. Usually that's how it's done. You get back a six digit code, you type it in, and then you have successfully, almost successfully activated and you're enabled to affect authentication. You're shown backup codes, what, what's that about? Um, what I'm doing right now, you shouldn't do with your backup codes, by the way. Um, that should be keep secret in a safe place, uh, store something else, not they are on the platform, but you should also store them somewhere else because that's your spare key. If you lose your device where you have activated your application, those codes help you to get into your account, assign another device to it, and then you have, uh, again, the convenience of using your smart device and getting into your account. So these are very important information you have to take care of. If you press the green button again, you also get an email that tells you that you have successfully activated and stresses the point again that you have to be very careful about your backup codes and, and store them in a, in a very secure location. There's also the link which points you to the platform where you can find your codes where you can download them. The next step should be that you mandate two-factor authentication for all the users of your organization. So you go to the uh, identity and access man management menu to users and then hit mandate two-factor authentication for all of your accounts on the organization. Of course, that can be removed, um, which you shouldn't do, but that's the important message if you have activated it small pop-up to fact authentication is enabled in your organization. That's the really important thing. Um, if you lose your device, if you switch phones, which should happen from time to time, then people switch their smartphones. Uh, you don't have to forget that you also move to the new device because uh, there's one golden rule with using your smart device in the security process, there can only be one. So you can only have one smart device, smartphone connected uh, for this login process. And if you want to use another one, you have to move that. And that's also possible via the user interface. Again, the backup codes, keep them in a, in a very secure place that you can go back in 
and do such things like moving your device. Or if you lose a device, then you have to go in, buy a code, and set up a new device for doing the security clearance with the second token. Um, in the user interface, very important. It's also the link you find in the email. That's where you can get your codes. Um, of course, what you can enable can be disabled. So you can also disable two-factor authentication. Uh, you get a, an information or you get a, a feedback as well from the platform mail again. Uh, also with a link where you can enable it again. But my take on that is that's not recommended to disable two-factor authentication. We would like to get the number up. Uh, so that we have a high percentage of accounts and, and um, using our platform with two-factor authentication because that's the first step to make it more secure and that there is no misuse of your resources by somebody else who can grab your password. It's so much harder if, if two-factor authentication is enabled. The next step, and it was mentioned, what was launching single sign-on integration, so that it's easier to integrate exoskeletal service in a more sophisticated and, and, and safer way to, to interact with services. Single sign-on is basically having an in-between service that you only have to remember one password and, one, and have to remember one um, user credentials to log on to different services. And there's this all services taking care of the other passwords and, and dealing with the authentication process. So that's what many enterprises are doing. And that can be done also. So where to find it? Again, you go to info, uh, <laughs> Identity and Access Management. And there you can find, if it's already enabled for your account. In my case, when I did that, I had to go talk to my colleagues and in your case, you have to talk to, to sales or you can do it via a, a support ticket that SSO is enabled for your account. Then you get this nice additional menu within the identity and access management menu. And then you can do the configuration of the SSO service. Um, and if or connected to your directory where all the user uh, information is hold, if it's open uh, ID connect, uh, the protocol is enabled, then we can talk to that service and we can integrate it. Uh, there's a lot of configuration, but that's something we probably can do in a, in a, in a future webinar on, on the technical basis. I just wanted to show the user interface, where to find it, that it's there, that you remember it. And single sign-on has real benefits to be used. Uh, if you're the technical person that already wants to try it out, that's, that's not a problem. Here's the link. Go to our community page and documentation you find on how to a step by step introduction how to configure it and how to make it work with your directory or with your single and on services uh, what are the benefits of single sign-on mitigating risk obviously so um, if you don't have to remember all that and uh, another benefit is uh, your credentials are then stored in your single sign-on solution and, and not with the, uh, some third party. So there's, there are no passwords and account information outside your organization. So that's what it is one big benefit of using single sign-on. Reducing password fatigue, yeah, remembering a lot of passwords and password combinations. You know where that end up. People are buying more post-it notes and then stick it to their screens or under their keyboards, which is not really increasing the security. So having to remember a lot of passwords is, is not a, a good, good thing to have. Reducing user authentication time, and that was interesting. I didn't find really good and, and, and catchy um, statistics, but what I've read up, um, reducing the time people spend logging on to different systems can add up easily to one to two working weeks if you consider full year. So that's that's a lot of time you can, can save there. And depending on how much external or how different services you use and how often people have to authenticate themselves with those services, that could be more, could be less, depending on how complex your, your environment is. Um, Seamless user experience, I just showed the diagram at the beginning, so I only have to remember one password. 
one user credential, I can combine that, of course, with two-factor authentication, then that entry is very secure, and the rest is handled via a system, which taking care of all the other uh, authentication information that's needed to go to the different services we usually use on, on a daily basis. Uh, centralizing and centralized management is the benefit, so you have everything in one directory and taking care of that. So if, if users coming, users going, uh, employees coming, employees going, uh, the handling of that getting way easier than if you have that in a distributed way within your IT organization. And last but not least, it's not only about security, it's also about cost and it's not, not a thing you can wipe from the table and forget about it. Uh, the IT costs associated with password resets could be major budget. So for larger enterprises in the US, I found a very interesting number. They have to set aside over a million annually for all those password related support costs. And that's stated by another uh, analyst in the same category as Gardner Forrester has done that study. And another number I found is so password reset in, the, in such enterprise environments costs around $70. Uh, and depending on how much um, additional effort you have to put in and, and how many uh, employees and, and users you have, this, this number could be higher or lower, of course, but it's not only about security, it's also about cost. And that's something you should keep in mind. And both things are available to use on the Exascale platform, two-factor authentication is so the, the entry security upgrade you can do for working more secure with your uh, Exascale environment. And on the other hand side, it's also, if you consider single sign-on, if you're a large organization or you have a complex organization using many services, um, then it can also make sense to introduce also the single sign-on and use that feature to improve all that points I just mentioned for your environment. So that was my 20 minutes of security pitch to motivate you to look into that and try it out and use those features that are available on our platform. And with that back to Dennis, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. So welcome to the technical part of the presentation. And this time I want to show you how you can deploy a real application on Exascale without using too much effort. In this case, we are deploying WordPress. So WordPress is a very wide known blog software. And for this, we will use Kubernetes. SKS is our managed Kubernetes service. And that means you don't have to like manage administration or something like that. You just get authentication to your Kubernetes service and then you can deploy applications. Of course, WordPress will run on virtual machines. So those virtual machines are actually managed by our Kubernetes service. And this time we are introducing something new. So we will use our external database service and that means you just say, okay, I want to have MySQL and I don't want to manage it. I don't want to update it. I don't want to create backups and so on. Just give me credentials and I want to use those. And this is what our database service does. So you really, really just say, okay, I need MySQL and you get a username, a password and a host name. Everything else like updating without downtime, of course, or security or backups is done by us. Of course, if you then install WordPress and did something wrong or so, then you can also always restore a backup by yourself. This is no problem at all. So let's get started. To do so, we could, of course, go to the XSK use interface. This is the interface, so we can launch virtual machines here, we can launch Kubernetes clusters here, and of course, we can also launch databases. So for Kubernetes, I would click on Compute, SKS, Scalable Kubernetes Service, and on 
add cluster. But this UI comes with a problem. So I can like put a cluster name here. So web cluster, descriptions, zones, the level, and so on. So I can choose a lot of different things. And the problem is when I work in a team and I create a lot of infrastructure, like let's say 10 different virtual machines with different distributions, then a Kubernetes cluster and a database service, then my other team members may not know what I actually chose here. So they would always have to look it up by themselves. And this is the reason why we are automating it this time. So for automation, I will use Terraform. Terraform is infrastructure as a code, and that means you won't click on anything and click everything together and connect it, but you will do so in code. So you can create every resource you can see here in code and also link it in code. And that means you can update it easily. You can also document it because it's already documented in code and it's easy to follow. So instead of using the UI, let's start with Terraform. I prefer, I prepared a little project. And if you didn't use Terraform before, don't worry, I will explain everything. So for example, let's start here. This is a resource. A resource could be a virtual machine, a Kubernetes cluster, or it could be a database. In this case, it is actually a database. So Exascale database means please create a database for me and name it in Terraform WordPress. Also, please do it in this zone. And this zone is defined here on top, Frankfurt. This is the name for Exascale. So this is the name for Terraform and this is the name for Exascale and we can just use the same one. Then I want to have a MySQL database and not a PostgreSQL database, for example, the plan, which is hobbyist, and hobbyist is our cheapest plan, so it's uh, just for development or just for trying it out. And the cool thing is, when you then run this file, it will create the database for you, and you can always change it afterwards. So if you say, okay, hobbyist, this doesn't give me the performance I need, then you can change it ju just to some other enterprise plan, and it will update it automatically. Also, updates are done automatically for uh, MySQL or for all other database services. And for that, you can specify a maintenance window. Also, I'm deactivating for this test the termination protection so that we can easily destroy it afterwards. Here, I define the admin and the admin password for MySQL. And I actually set it in this script. And I did it like this because the idea is that you don't keep the script in your repository, but that you set those variables with a CI system like GitHub, for example. Of course, when I create a database, I get credentials and I also get a host name. And the host name is saved in an output variable and it's called database URI. You will see later um, what it consists of. Also, like I said, we will use Kubernetes. So that means here I will create a SKS Kubernetes cluster, again in Frankfurt. So that's the reason why I put the zone in the variable so I don't have to write like Frankfurt 10 times. The name of the cluster, the version, a description, and we say, okay, it should be an enterprise cluster, so pro, and give me networking. Also, Kubernetes always needs security groups. So Kubernetes is a complicated service and it requires different ports to be opened. And I define those ports actually here. So I'm saying, give me a security group. And these are the security group rules. For example, in this case, it says, okay, please open port 10250. 
on TCP. And you already see, this is really a documentation also. So it just doesn't only create um, the security groups. Uh, other team members, when you put this Terraform file in your repository, um, can actually see what you did. So we open up this port, then the UDP port 4789, which is for Kubernetes networking, the port 30,000 to 32,000, which is for the load lancer. So of course, our WordPress application needs an external IP, so we can actually access it. And we need those virtual machines where our application can run. This node pool defines the virtual machines. And it says, okay, please use medium machines. Medium machines consist of two cores and four gigabyte of RAM. And give me three machines. And also when you want to scale, you can just like start with three virtual machines and then apply this configuration. And if you say, okay, I need more performance, then don't give me three, but just six. So just replace this number, apply it again, and everything will be done automatically. So let's apply it. We will go in our terminal and I'm in the same folder as this file. And it means I can now run Terraform apply. Here we can see that it will do some things. So for example, it will create these virtual machines and some things are already known because I specified them like the size, like three virtual machines. But of course, some other things like the IP address will be only known afterwards. So I can, if I need them, save them in an output variable. And this is the same thing I did with the database. So um, of course the database URL will be only known afterwards. And that means I need to save them in a variable. And if we see, okay, that looks good, then we can apply it. Then we can say yes. And then it will actually start to create everything. So when we, took a, when we take a look into the user interface, we will be shortly seen that here our stuff is created. So we see here our Kubernetes cluster, which is set up. We can also take a look at database as a service and see that we are actually getting our WordPress database also set up. And of course, you don't have to use Terraform. So there are a lot of options. You can use Terraform like me, but you can also um, create scripts to use our Exascale CLI or you can just use our API. So everything you see here, here is also creatable with the API and it means you can really automate everything. So we will have to wait until the Kubernetes cluster is created. It will take around two minutes and we are quite fast with that because other providers usually need 10 to 20 minutes. We can also see the progress here. And we just saw, okay, the Kubernetes cluster was completed. And now everything is completed, so everything is ready. So now we have the Kubernetes cluster and we have the database. What is still missing is our application. And for that, I created separate scripts. Of course, those scripts I could also have included into Terraform, but I will explain later why I didn't. The first script is very simple. It just gets the credentials of Kubernetes and saves them into our cube config file. So let's run it. And now the credentials are saved. 
Also for WordPress, we need another software. And the software is called Longhorn. So Longhorn actually um, provides storage for Kubernetes. So it sees the local storage of all virtual machines and provides them in a highly replicated manner. And we won't use Longhorn for the database, but WordPress, of course, has like blog posts and also media files. So I can upload videos, I can upload pictures, and to store them inside our Kubernetes cluster, I will just use Longhorn. Installing Longhorn is really simple. So this script starts by using Helm and we add a repository with Helm. So Helm is just a yeah, package manager for Kubernetes. It's, you can say, a bit similar to the Linux package manager like apt-get. Um, but instead of installing something on an operating system, it installs a manifest in a Kubernetes cluster. In this case, I'm saying, OK, please add Longhorn locally on my MacBook, the repository, and then use this repository to install it. So it says Helm install, then the name I want, so I can choose any name, then Longhorn from the Longhorn organization, and into this namespace. So let's start to run it. So deploying Longhorn takes a bit of time. And instead of just saying, OK, um, please wait, um, it takes time, I made here a comment which waits until the Kubernetes deployment is ready. So that means it will just pull the status of the so-called rollout and then really wait until it's finished. And the idea is basically that you can use a CI system to like trigger the Terraform state. So say, OK, Terraform apply with a button, for example, on GitHub. And then use the same CI system just to call up those scripts. So you may notice my scripts are not interactive. When you call them, they just run and they just install everything automatically. And that means you can easily automate them. So first run just this script, then this script, and this script. Uh, and you don't have to like put sleeps between them or something like that. Um, it will just work be be because every script will wait by themselves. So Longhorn is installed. And now let's look into WordPress. So for installing WordPress, we use a ready-to-use Helm chart by Bitnami. So for a lot of popular applications like WordPress or like uh, forum softwares and so on, there exists uh, usually some kind of hand charts on the internet. And it means you don't have to write anything in Kubernetes or know too much about it. And you can just use those ready to use charts. The first step, however, is to get the database URL. And it means I will save this comment into a variable. So when I run it manually, you can see we get a database URL. So it says MySQL, then the username and the admin of the database, then the host name, and we use Aven as backend. So Aven is our database provider. So we see a URL to Aven and the database name. And what I'm doing right now is I'm splitting these parameters up. So I'm saying, OK, user is this parameter, and then just take like uh, this, and then the password, and so on. So that means I can now start the installation of WordPress, because it will take the URL, the output URL, split it up, and then provide it as parameters to the Helm chart. So one parameter is, for example, that it shouldn't include a database and that it instead should use an external database. Also, I'm saying, OK, please use the 
Longhorn storage class for persistent storage because for like the media files. And this should be the username of the WordPress installation and this should be the password. Also, I'm calling this deployment block. So like I said, you can call it anything. And I'm saying, okay, please use this chart. And that means it will then completely run on Kubernetes. Of course, you can also deploy this chart multiple times. You just have to call it differently or put it in a different namespace. And that means when you have customers who say, okay, I need WordPress instances, then you can like create one Kubernetes cluster and use this cluster to um, yeah, deploy 100 WordPress um, instances. And that means, of course, you can save then costs in the end. So the Helm chart will actually create a load balancer. So when we take a look into the access care user interface and then click on load balancers, we can see, okay, there's a load lens setup and it wasn't there before. And it got an external IP address. We can also check it with kubectl get svz. So get services. And there we see, okay, um, we have a service called block WordPress and it has this IP address. So let's call it. And there we can see WordPress is now running and WordPress actually uses our database um, to store like the block data. And that's how simple you can actually deploy WordPress. Let's also take a look again into the database. So here we can see, okay, WordPress deployed in Frankfurt. But what if you want to move your database to some other location? Well, it's actually quite simple. You can just click here, then on fork, then give it a different name, like WordPress in Vienna, choose Vienna, and then you can also choose any plan. So you can say, okay, I want a hobbyist again, or I want to move it now to an uh, enterprise plan like startup or business or premium. In the default setting, it will transfer all your data from the latest transaction, but you can also say, okay, no, please um, transfer the data from a specific time point. And that means now it will clone this database and deploy it in Vienna. Also, another very cool feature when you want to move from another cloud provider is that you can select the database you need, like again, MySQL or PostgreSQL. Specify the name, of course, again, the zone, the plan, but you can also migrate automatically from somewhere else. So you can say, for example, okay, I have a database set up on premise, but I want to migrate now to Exascale. Then you can put here up the host name of your old database, the password and the database name, and Exascale will automatically connect to your old database and copy every data to the new database you will create here. And of course, the database is built with security in mind, so that means you can only connect with SSL to the database and you can also specify an IP address filter. So in this case, everything would be allowed, but you can also say, okay, please just allow um, my company to connect to the database or please just only allow a specific instance to connect to the database. So everything is set up and if you're finished and you just wanted to test everything and just use a little sandbox, then you can type Terraform destroy again. And then you can, if you want, um, destroy your whole infrastructure in one go. 
So this repository will be, of course, provided to you. I also have some notes. So for example, why I didn't use um, like Kubernetes objects and Helm objects to deploy it. So the problem is when you use Terraform together with the Kubernetes plugin, then the Kubernetes plugin of Terraform always must match the version of your, of your cluster. And if you use a very recent version of Kubernetes, then Terraform might not keep up with its plugins, and that means you're dependent on them. Of course, uh, you can also use other means, like I said, like API requests to automate everything, or you can even pack this whole script in a CI and then use the CI with triggers, like for example, with buttons or something like that to automate the installation or to automate, for example, scaling. Okay, so that was my little demo. Thank you very much, Dennis. I just need to change that one, yes. So thank you, Antoine, Hans, and Dennis for the insights around Kubernetes and database as a service interaction is in a secure cloud environment. In the meantime, we have received some questions that we would like to answer in the Q&A session. Please, all videos on, perfect. As we still have eight minutes left for the Q&A, we might not take uh, every answer and all the questions, but we will catch up to everything who, or everybody who raised a question, but not by wasting time. And I would like to start with the first question. It is, can we migrate from different providers? Yes, so I've just shown it. So you can migrate basically from every cloud provider. You just have to put in the credentials um, in the user interface and everything is done then automatically. Thank you very much. Not, not, not the Fox though, huh? this is only uh, incoming. The, the Fox, they work uh, from uh, one zone to the same zone, from one zone to another zone. Uh, and, and various plans, uh, like also Denise showed in the in the interface. So I think that's tackling the question: When doing forks, are all data transferred, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. So if you do a fork from like Vienna to Frankfurt, then the database will be copied um, completely to Frankfurt. So that means you will also retain your data then. All databases, uh, Denise. Maybe that was the the, the questions. Because you you could, you could have uh, multiple databases, I guess, in in uh, in one service, but it, it forks everything, right? Yeah. Of course, yeah. So the third question is: Can I deploy multiple WordPress or other apps on one cluster this way? Yeah, of course. So you can like deploy like 10 WordPress instances, but you can also mix it, of course. So Kubernetes doesn't have a like a limit there, just a performance limit, you can say. Um, so you can basically just use one cluster, deploy multiple cu customers there, and this way you can also save costs. The next question is related to SSO. Can we use SSO for SKS2? Um, so uh, no, th those are two two separate things. Okay, so uh, the current uh, uh, Exoscale SSO implementation is that the Exoscale platform uh, needs can can use an external identity provider uh, to 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 authenticate uh, the the organization users. It happens that uh, um, Kubernetes and then therefore also SKS can also um, is a, is compatible with OpenID Connect. Okay, so this is a feature we released uh, not long ago in the SKS a API. Um, so if you are a company already having a, uh, an identity provider uh, centralized, which uh, supports ID, uh, OpenID Connect, uh, then you could plug the two things. Uh, you could plug your various SKS clusters to your central uh, uh, authentication and as well as the Exoscale uh, uh, Pro uh, platform access. In the future, we intend to also 
for, for those that don't have an external identity provider to uh, be able to use the uh, exoskeletal user base as a uh, as a, an identity provider for resources like uh, like Kubernetes clusters, but that's uh, that's not there yet with the version with what we're rolling out uh, with exoskeletal SSO today. Thank you. The next question was raised while Dennis demo. Um, are backups included or do I have to manage them? Um, it depends on the plan. So if you choose a startup or if you choose like premium and um, depending on that, there are a number of backups included and they're done automatically and you can also restore for them from them. Thank you. We're quite fast. So the last question is uh, ongoing. So this is also for SSO. Question is, can we do groups with SSO? Groups, it, um, uh, maybe it's in the sense of restricting to like in a in a directory to to category of users, etc. So um, each organization is different. Um, so, so we didn't implement uh like, like a, sp a specific way of of doing this instead there's a uh that there's a, an expression language uh which is available which you can see it's not really not complicated it's, it's a cel uh there's it's all in the documentation if you want to look have a look at that which will enable you to 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 write a, a query uh so that it, only users matching those criteria in your query will be able to uh, uh, authenticate and connect with the with the exoscale organization. Um, so it's it's very flexible. Just requires a, a few lines of uh, uh, of of this uh, of this language. Thank you very much. So no questions raised again. So we can close the Q and A really on point so uh, just, just for, one more i think yeah. ah there's some there's one coming in so the database as a service of encryption at rest does the related backups also encrypted yes all the way and this is one of the reasons why you cannot i mean the the all the plans for exoskeletal database uh, as a service they come with backup included at no extra cost okay this is not the case also on uh, other cloud platforms. So do, do check that when you're doing your, uh, your, your price assessment as well. Um, but the backups are, are fully on, uh, uh, they're, they're fully automated, uh, stored on the, on the object store, of course, which it, in itself also uh, splits every data in three copies. So the resiliency is, is, uh, is, is super high. Uh, but we don't give access directly to to those uh, to those backup files. The way to do a restore uh, or to to you get your data out is do a fork, and then you can export as well with the traditional tools. I mean, there's uh, Postgres or, or MySQL that dumps uh, Redis as well as uh, as its own um, native way of uh, of exporting. Uh, uh, data if you need that uh, into into a external environment. Thank you very much. So with the help of the last questions, we made it directly on point. So Perfect. many thanks to our speakers and the openness in answering the questions. Likewise, I thank our audience for the privilege of your time. And on a final note, you will see tomorrow during the day the address documents and the recording by mail. On that note, I wish you a pleasant rest of the working day and see you soon on Exascale. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.